United States Catholic Charities rally to the battle against starvation as millions of pounds of food pour into New York City warehouses and are sorted for shipment overseas. 14,000 Catholic parishes throughout the United States contribute to the shipments of food for a hungry world. Cardinal Spellman of New York and Cardinal Griffin of England inspect the project, which has already shipped over 24 million pounds of foodstuffs. Wherever there are hungry people goes the food of the Catholic Charities, without regard to race, creed, or color. The shipping facilities operate 24 hours a day, sending their cargo to the four corners of the earth. At the Hall of Fame at New York University, a nation shrined to its great, a noted Negro educator takes his place alongside Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln, the man who freed the slaves. Booker T. Washington was born a slave, and today notables of all races and creeds gather to do him homage. Alongside others who helped make America great, he will be immortalized in bronze. As leaders of the university and members of his family look on, Gloria Washington unveils the bust of her grandfather, first of his race to be memorialized here. For his work at the great Negro University, Tuskegee Institute, for his efforts at improving relations between all men, Booker T. Washington is enshrined forever. Condemned by an American military court, the criminals of Dachau concentration camp go to the scaffold. Simon Cairn, stormtrooper sadist, carries flowers, fertilized, no doubt, by the blood of his countless victims. Handcuffed for the climb up the 13 steps, a killer pays the penalty for the terror, agony, and horror he brought to thousands. Now the most merciless of the Dachau killers, Dr. Klaus Karl Schilling. He froze camp inmates alive, injected thousands with deadly disease germs, blinded children in eye grafting experiments, all for the betterment of the Nazi master race. The world will be a cleaner place without him and all his kind. In Prague, before the People's Court, stands Karl Hermann Frank, who rose through blood and treachery to become Nazi overlord of Czechoslovakia. Having been tried and found guilty, Frank now hears his sentence read. For treason, for 300,000 murders, and for responsibility in wiping out the entire village of Lidice, the sentence is death. On the following day, 3,000 men and women who have known Frank's brutality attend his public execution. Now, harmless looking in his stripped down stormtrooper uniform, this cold-blooded tyrant and killer had stopped at no crime in his efforts to force Nazism down stubborn Czech throats. There are no tears for Karl Hermann Frank. In dense, uncharted forests of Central America, wild tribes of Chocos Indians begin the banana harvest. Bananas grow wild in Panama. In Darien, 200 miles south of the Panama Canal, the Chocos Indian villages are visited for the first time by newsreel cameras. To these remote tribesmen, paint for their faces and tobacco are worth more than money. Off 
around the trip to the banana country. The Chocos in their hunting grounds go to work with sharp machetes, heavy two-foot blades that also build their houses and cut their hair. To get some banana stems, the entire tree is felled. But in the jungle, it grows back again to produce more fruit. During the war, the Chocos collected wild rubber. In peace, they've gone back into the fruit business. A large wild boar killed by bow and arrow means a feast when they get home. The dugout canoes are 50 feet long, hollowed out of mahogany and cedar log. Loaded to the gunnels, the boats carry up to a ton of fruit. Near the coast, cargoes are transferred to river steamboats that carry them to market. There's no refrigeration here, and the green bananas have to be handled quickly lest they spoil in too much tropic heat. Visited by few people from the outside world, the Chocos Indians contribute their part to the world's food supply. Streets of crowded New York are the regular playgrounds of thousands of children who will be the men and women of tomorrow. But the circumstance of nothing to do and no place to go doesn't leave much choice when it comes to hunting fun and recreation. And the street in many neighborhoods is all there is. Ten years ago, to combat this problem, the New York Police Department organized the Police Athletic League. Arts and crafts, athletics and music, and many other recreational activities are offered at 25 Police Athletic League centers throughout New York City's 81 police precincts. Boat rides up the Hudson River last summer provided outings for 50,000 New York boys and girls. This year, there will be hundreds of athletic teams in baseball, swimming, basketball, and other sports. The broad police facilities are open to both boys and girls up to 18. The Police Athletic League depends entirely on voluntary contributions. The police of the city of New York are proud of their athletic league and the fine effect their work is having on the youth of the city. A day that will live in history. D-Day, the invasion of Hitler's Europe. America pauses to look back two years to the world's greatest military operation. Looks back to salute these thousands of untried heroes who helped bring Hitler's veterans to defeat. They huddled along the beachheads that morning. They fought, they bled, and they died. And today in England, the country that stood alone for so many months of war remembers. At a solemn ceremony at the American Military Cemetery in Cambridge, a tribute to the almost 250,000 Americans who gave their lives in the Second World War. France remembers. Here where thousands fell in battle, where thousands lie buried, their memory is honored. A soldier has not forgotten a soldier friend who is gone. Belgium remembers. Twice devastated by war in our time, Belgium acknowledges its debt to those who must not have died in vain. Liberated Europe pays its respects to those who gave their lives that the world might be free. Oh, my God.